Here we go. Hi everyone. Welcome to the Mood Disorder Support and Education Group. We are in the Triangle area of North Carolina. And right now we have Jeffrey Zeger, who is going to talk about the default mode network, which is really kind of cool. Um, I'm Cindy Jones, the disembodied voice. I'm a clinician in this area, just by the way. Um, this is really good to bring up something that, you know, and all this time I haven't heard it phrased this way. So I was very interested in having you share it with the group, Jeff. So go, why don't you take it away? And remember, anybody, if you have questions, you can chat, you can put it in the chat, and uh, I'll help field it for Jeff during this talk. Okay. So let me see, where's my thumbnail? Okay, Jeffrey, there we go. Active speaker. So um, now I'm just going to put back that. So um, thank you for to Cindy for having me be here. Um, just as a funny, uh, as a, a therapist who has done telehealth during pandemic, um, I want to show you what it's like to actually do telehealth with an eight-year-old who is using their cell phone during telehealth sessions. Okay. <laughs> That's what it's like. Okay. So any therapist who has experienced uh, doing telehealth with an eight-year-old uh, will know that that's what it's like. Um, default mode network, this was something that I stumbled across. And as I've discussed with other colleagues, they researched it and they thought about it. And I put this together. The really interesting thing about what we're going to talk about today is that it depathologizes worry rumination, grinding, um, worrying, thinking, going to the past and going to the future. The really interesting thing about this is it actually says it's more of the norm to do that when you're not focused on something in your immediate foreground. Um, and my, my hope is that the take home for you is, oh, this is just the way my brain operates. You know, this comes from a little bit more of a bio evolutionary standpoint or lens that this actually helped us to survive. And unfortunately, in the modern world, when we don't have saber toothed tigers that are coming after us, it could be worrisome and bothersome. So let's get into talking about what this thing is on this. Opening screen, you could see a tail of two brains. It's not literally two brains. It's different parts of the brain. Um, system one, system two, that's in the graphic. So this is what it actually is. Let me pull this over. System one, otherwise known as the default mode network is um, medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate. I know that sounds technical, but I'm actually going to bring this down to what it's like in real time in just a second. Uh, but system one is fast, automatic, early in evolution. It's the thing that um, developed before other aspects of our brain. Part of our daydreaming, self-referential, meaning it's all about me. Who am I? What do I want to do? What are my priorities? Um, what do I think of that? What should I say in the next conversation? And it's very raw, it's very primitive. The other part is slower, more deliberate, more focused, conscious, based on values, based on priorities. And the, uh, the interesting thing about this graphic is it's part of an article that talks about how mindfulness can help us to use more system two, more conscious, more deliberate, more um, focused, as opposed to system one, which is much more running in the background, even when we don't think that it's running. Um, there's also articles about how system one is actually the one that is running when we are doing things autonomically. So for example, if I'm driving and I'm not really thinking about driving, that's all system one because it's just part of muscle memory, but actually being conscientious of 
oh, I'm driving too fast. Uh Oh, there's a guy who I need to kind of veer away from. That's more system two. So the default mode network refers to the neuro, neurological pattern that occurs when the brain is at rest. When we are not focusing on things that are in our immediate foreground, this is what is active. And there's gonna be a little video that I show in just a few minutes. Have you guys ever used the terms or heard it was in the back of my mind? So this is talking about foreground and background. Um, for those of you who are clinicians who, or who've studied psychology, foreground background does come from gestalt, gestalt therapy and Fritz, Fritz curls. Um, foreground is what's actually in, in our immediate foreground and background is stuff that is back here. It's not prominent. And then what happens is when we stop thinking about the things that are in our foreground, the background comes to the foreground. So have you ever had or heard of situations where someone says, yeah, the worry that I have isn't as prominent when I'm distracting myself with activities or I'm focused on something, but then at night when I don't have anything to do, or in the morning when I first wake up, there's a lot of worry. Well, that's usually because the default mode network is prominent. And as people get out of the bed and go to the bathroom and do what they need to do and get into the day, then the busy, anxious thoughts or depressed thoughts go to the background and life stuff, things in the foreground, come to the foreground. So my, my desired take home is to realize oh, this is very much, that phenomenon that I just described is very much part of the way our brain is programmed. Trying to help someone to get over the hump of when they wake up and they have a lot of worry of the day to be able to get into the day and into life rather than going, oh my gosh, I've got so much worry and now I'm gonna go back to bed. Well, no, by the time someone goes about 15 minutes into their day, they're actually engaged in much more focused work and pursuing life goals, and the default mode network goes to the background. At rest, we're actually thinking a lot. Essentially, we are daydreaming, and these brain regions are active, very active. Um, one of the common components of our thoughts um, when we're in this state is that they are very self-referential. Who am I? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I want to do? Why did that person say that? Um, what's going to happen in the future? This is all of the survival mechanism. Um, <laughs> if the hominids that were on the tundra didn't actually think well, we're going to go hunting, but I wonder if that um, water source is full. I might die. That's very survivalistic. In other words, the default mode network of thinking of me and my crew and my pack and my, my family, if we actually go do something, will we be able to survive? That was very um, helpful to survival. But unfortunately, we live in a modern world where we don't have saber-toothed tigers. We don't have to worry about water sources. We don't have to be as um, family and community oriented to survive. Unfortunately, it has become very individualistic, um, which causes a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression. We're thinking about ourselves in some way, for example, fantasizing about what we will do in the future or what so-and-so said to us in the past. This is the interesting thing. It turns out we spend about 50% of our waking hours in this place of who, what, when, where, how. And it's very past, present, future oriented about what happened in the past. Who am I today? What do we wanna do? What's gonna happen in the future? All right, moving on to the next slide. When one is physically threatened, system one, the go-to network, 
um, fight or flight is the one that's active. And as we have evolved, however, life situations have become more nuanced. And those binary decisions of fight or flight are not productive. You know, it's more nuanced, like, hmm, let me think about that. Or, hey, man, you're really stressed out and you're kind of throwing a lot of negative energy at me. Would you back up? Because I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding you. That type of stuff, okay? It doesn't have to be... Um, you're angry at me and now I'm going to push back. That's binary. Most of the, uh, in fact, the more stressed we become, the more, this is the case, uh, survival. Yeah. It may have been a survival advantage to be in system one or the default mode network, uh, but it's not productive, helpful, or optimized for modern living. And so being able to learn, oh, I'm having a pop-up that is coming from the default mode network um, is helpful. And that's where mindfulness and CBT and being able to catch yourself when you're having the impulse of, I need to do this. Um, whoa, no, you don't. Things are much more nuanced. We're living in a modern society. Despite what the old brain is whispering, the default mode network, uh, when you have a disagreement, fight or flight is not the best option. So being able to slow down, be more um, conscientious, be more system two based, slowing down, slowing down, not everything is urgent. System two involves um, evolutionary recent. So the, the theory here and the basic neuroanatomy and theory is that that system two, which is more clear, deliberate, focused, mature, is actually something that developed later in our evolution. Uh, it's much more related to thoughtful and conscious decisions. Um, uh, later brain regions evolved because our needs changed and then we changed. Alternatively, our needs changed and our brain evolved. Either way, the ability for us to reason and override instinct and fear and binary uh, arrived later. Basically, we have hardware that is somewhere between 100 and 300,000 years old but we're in a modern age and we don't need that hardware. We need a different software. Does that make sense? We still have that default mode network, which is very fire flight and immediate and I need to take care of the situation right now, but the circumstances are not binary of fight or flight. So it's almost like we've created a world that goes against our hardware or our, our natural makeup. Ah, this is a video. Hang on. So the video is a little bur blurry, but as you could see at the top, I said, the YouTube vid is a little fun fuzzy, but hey, Morgan Freeman is actually narrating. And hey, when Morgan Freeman narrates something, you know, you should take it seriously. Have you guys ever seen the funny haha -ha memes of like, I wish Morgan Freeman would narrate my life? <laughs> okay, Morgan Freeman's voice in our lives. So let's take a look at this. After you spent imaging brains, Mark, is it can you guys hear that by the way? Okay. Eventually discovered an entire method network that coordinates our movements with our senses. And it turns on the moment you stop thinking. Nobody was even looking for this. It was almost by accident. It came to our attention that if you just were laying in a scanner and you were looking at your brain, and then we asked you to do something, not only did things go up, but certain things went down. Certain parts of the brain seem to turn off whenever we begin a task. Those same regions become highly active whenever we are quiet and relaxed. Marcus calls these linked sections of the brain the default mode network. 
because the brain defaults to this activity whenever we are not doing anything else. In fact, the brain is just as active in this default mode as when we're consciously doing something. After careful analysis, Marcus thinks he understands why. The default mode is deeply important in creating an ability to predict what's going to happen next. I think it's really critical. In the same way... Okay. Now that we've uh, talked a little bit and you saw the, the video, After years. what are your thoughts, Cindy? Can you actually activate or unmute so that people could say, oh, yeah, I can relate to that, or let's have a, a little bit of a dialogue right now in the middle of this presentation. Yeah, if, if people want to, um, you can either, you can send something in the chat or just unmute yourself and kind of come, come forward with the question. We're just going to handle this a little differently and give a little bit more uh, interaction. Um, for me, I wonder, did you, you know, did you call Morgan Freeman up and ask him for this? Um, I have not actually heard of this before talking with you, so it's very interesting. But as, as it's presented, I, I feel like clients have spoken about this, of, of feeling like there's something else that's going, not that they can feel it, but that there's a, a lot of activity that's happening for them, even if they're not consciously, you know, trying. And at times it's quite distressing, or sometimes it's very pleasant. And so before talking to you, I had not really had a frame of reference about it. Yeah, um, and folks will describe it as, you know, racing thoughts, chatter, um, flow charting, thinking of contingency plans, um, the hamster in the wheel, yeah. you know, the hamster in the wheel. And what I'm pointing is neurobiology has demonstrated that that's what happens when we're not focused on day-to-day -day activities, that that is sort of the natural default. That's where our brain goes to kind of process what happened today and what happened, you know, who am I and what do I want to do and uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. So I'm, I'm trying to relay the idea that when that chatter happens and look, I'm a therapist, but I'm, I'm subject to chatter too. Okay. When that chatter happens, it's not necessarily fully pathological. The question then becomes, how does somebody deal with it? How, how bothersome in it is it? Does somebody have the coping skills to say, okay, I, I do need to let this go now because just staying in that loop is bothering me and I need to learn how to disengage from it. Those are more of the questions rather than it's happening or not happening. Right. Any other thoughts before we go to the next slide? We'll come back. Okay, we'll talk more at the uh, end, but mm -hmm. let me see, moving to the, here we go. So this is a review of some of the slides but breaks things down. System one, default mode network does not require working memory. It is autonomic. It happens when we're not thinking. It's fast. Okay. It's not conscious. We're not actually making those choices. It is biased responses, meaning it's, it's very binary. It's good or it's bad, those value judgments. System two, which is much more calm and focused, it requires working memory. Um, cognitive decoupling, in other words, I am thinking but separating the emotionality from it. It is slower. Um, it is conscious, it is done by choice. I wanna, I wanna do an example of what working memory is. Folks probably have heard of working memory and ADHD. I'm just gonna do a little bit of an, an experiment. Hey, Cindy, would you be willing to be my guinea pig? I love guinea pigs, yes. I want you to remember the following numbers. Ready? Yes. Two, six, eight, nine, five. Six. Say those one time. Two, 
Did she get it right, people? Okay. What'd you have for dinner or lunch? I had, uh, what did I have for lunch? Um, I had chicken with some leftover Chinese food. <gasps> leftover Chinese food. Me too. <laughs> okay. What were those five numbers I asked you to remember? Um, I think two, six, eight, nine, five. Okay. Cool? What I'd like you to do now without counting on your fingers and toes is take the first number and the fourth number just in your mind and add it. Um, okay. What is it, please? 11. Okay. Yeah. So just remembering the numbers in sequence is short term memory. Uh huh in your mind being able to manipulate the information add this number and this uh, uh, uh oh i better not put my middle finger up you know <laughs> what i mean adding the two numbers in your mind is working memory uh -huh. the working memory is when we have information in our virtual space and we're manipulating it so for example if i was going to drive somewhere and i was like well i need to go down this street and then take a right and i'll go to that's me taking the information and manipulating it. That's working memory. So system one, the fight or flight autonomic does not require as much of that working memory. System two, which is calmer, slower, conscientious, does require, what do I want to do? What is the best thing to do in this situation? How do I want to say it? You see how it's actually manipulating information in that virtual space? So does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So working memory is one of the things that is actually addressed with ADHD, trying to increase one's ability to store information and manipulate it um, because working memory with ADHD has been found to be a little bit less active. Um, it's kind of like, RAM on computers, random access memory. If you only have one chip, you can only run one program. If you increase working memory or RAM, like on a computer, you can have more information stored and utilized. All right. The default mode network is very self-referential and it's all about me, 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 me. It's, it is the neurological basis of the self. You've heard of self-esteem, self-enhancing, uh, self-care. Well, there's self-referential. I don't know about you guys, but the self is a composite of your thoughts, your feelings, your brain, your physiology, um, your history. It's kind of like everything wrapped together as an amalgam which makes up the self the self the brain and the mind are three different things but they affect each other so self-reference referring to traits and descriptions of oneself i'm a good guy i'm not a good guy i'm honest uh i'm not you know intj i'm introspective okay those types of things that's very self-referential these are the characteristics that I identify with myself. Emotion of oneself, reflecting on one's emotion, being able to have the observing ego of saying, oh, this is what I feel. I'm observing what I feel. This is really interesting, remembering the past and imagining the future, recalling events that happened in the past, and envisioning events that might happen in the future. And our past can sometimes inform what we think might happen in the future or how we might respond in the future. Um, I wanna go to, the, let me see, where's the, ah, can, can you guys actually see the thing that's at the top there? Wait, 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 wait. A wise old man, can you see that? Or is it clouded? Okay. A wise old man said, do you mind if I use a, a, a little bit of a bad word? 
Does anybody mind? Okay. I have to actually use the old man voice because it really kind of gives the impact. If you have one foot in the future and you've got one foot in the past, then you're pissing all over today. I have heard in my training that depression can actually be understood about as more related to the past. Regrets, things that I didn't do, things that uh, hurts and losses from the past. And anxiety can be more related to the future. What's going to happen? Will I lose something? Will I benefit? Will I be able to reach my goals? So depression, past, anxiety, future, very broad brush strokes. There, it's much more complicated than that, but it's one way of understanding things. So the default mode network does a lot of recalling of things in the past and envisioning of the future. And it's very primitive and automatic and autonomic and fear-based. It's not the higher levels of functioning of, I want to make choices based on my values. It's much more, Ugh. this thing happened in the past. Is it going to happen again in the future? Okay, does that make sense? So I'm tying this all together about how the neural anatomy and the structures that we have relate to mood, all right? These are some other things. Uh, they're kind of technical. And if you want, I could send the PowerPoint to Cindy and she could send it to other folks, but it gets a little bit more technical. I wanna to move to when we're under the influence of the default mode network, we ruminate. We recall a funny look that a colleague gave us and we wonder what he meant or she meant by that. Was it really a funny look or was it nothing at all? It's self-referential means making an event about us. That doesn't mean you're egocentric or narcissist. Let's take that off the plate. That is the usual, like we, we have our own experience to call, to call upon and refer to. So if I'm walking down the hall and I say to the boss, hey boss, and the boss just goes, hi Jeff, and walks really quick right by me. And I start going, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Am I gonna get fired? That's not like I'm narcissistic. It's just, that's all I have to, re to refer to. It takes work to be able to say, I don't know why he was a busy place, just kind of brushed me off, but it's not about me. Learning how to depersonalize, okay, is part of the other uh, system too. There might be the initial, oh my God, am I gonna get fired? Is he mad at me? That might be the initial, but then being able to back up and say, it's not about me. Maybe he's going to a meeting because there's an emergency that has nothing to do with me. That's the, that's the system to the more mature part of us, all right? You guys have heard of the amygdala, right? It's involved with fight or flight. I don't know if you guys have known this. I, I learned this within the past couple of years, but amygdala, the Latin word for it means almond because it's kind of almond shaped. And that's why I've got a little almond right there going, ah, there was a psychiatrist that I worked with who said, on a biological level, our brains and fight or flight cannot differentiate, oh my gosh, I've got a lot of work to do and a saber tooth tiger. On a basic biological level, the amygdala and hippocampus and what's called the HPA, hippocampal pituitary axis, which is part of the fight or flight, just knows danger. So it doesn't respond to a high workload or some modern stress different from saber tooth tiger. Oh my God, I'm going to get eaten. But now that we know that, we could actually mitigate just because the biological response and our hardware says, oh my God, danger. Whoa, 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 let me slow down. I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna get fired. 
I've got a lot to do. I just got to chip away at it. Okay. Learning how to calm down those parts of us, which go fight or flight default mode network. There's a really good article. Why we can't just get rid of anxiety and stress. Um, when I read this article, I was like, this woman says, our brains are wired for survival, not happiness. Isn't that, isn't that wild? What do you guys think of that? At the end of the, the discussion, I'd like to know your thoughts about that. There's all of these television commercials which show people like being happy and running down the beach in slow motion with a big smile on. And it's like, is that the way you're supposed to be in modern world? And then we're all looking at that going, well, I'm not like that. There must be something wrong with me. No, it's a commercial. Our brains are wired for survival, not happiness. This is why our brains keep bringing up negative emotions, past mistakes, worries about the future. She goes on to say it doesn't work to just shove them out of the way, pretend they don't exist. How can we process through them so that way we can go, ah, I know where this is coming from. It's uncomfortable, but I'm not going to let it dictate what I do. Easier said than done, but something to work towards. Our physiological systems can react to mental images and events as if they were happening in the real world. What this means is in my mind's eye, if I am playing a movie in my head of something bad that I think might happen, my body is reacting to it as if it was really happening, even though it's not happening. If I'm thinking, oh my God, something bad is gonna happen, I'm gonna get a fight or flight adrenaline response. And I'm here in my apartment with my cats and I'm cool. <laughs> so being able to go, oh, okay, that narrative in my brain and the default mode network thinking, uh, something bad is gonna happen. I need to let that go, disengage from it and settle in and just enjoy my cats. Negative emotions, I'm looking at number five, such as fear, shame, may help us to survive as young children. But as we grow older, living in that place and using those scripts becomes um, uh, not effective. So learning how to use a different skill set and how to approach something differently as we grow up is important. So this is a funny, have you guys ever seen this meme, the meme of the brain and the person who's trying to sleep? Okay, it's really popular on the internet. I'm a, I'm a meme junkie, I love, uh, I love memes. So there's the brain, hey, are you asleep? And she says, yes, now shut up, she's trying to go to sleep. And then the brain goes into the past and digs up do you remember in fourth grade when that kid called you a poopy head and you didn't do anything? You should have called him a poopy head back. And all of a sudden, bing, you could see her eyes are wide open thinking about that thing from fourth grade. So that's the default mode network going into these events of the past that were hurtful, shameful, unresolved, bringing it back up. And then it keeps us awake at night. So have you guys ever had pop-ups like that where you recall something that occurred and you go, oh, I really should have done this. There's a funny thing on the internet that says after 20 years of making and recreating arguments in my mind, I finally won that argument with the guy in fourth grade. <laughs> okay, all right. So that's talking about that part of our brain default mode net network which is still trying to process and resolve those events from the past. Um, people with anxiety and depression tend to replay upsetting scenes over and over in their minds to the point of obsession. Intellectually, I, I believe that most people know 
I can't really resolve that thing, but I can't seem to stop it. The, there's two parts, the emotional and the rational. Rationally, I know thinking about it over and over doesn't help, but the emotional just keeps you know, encroaching. And that internal conflict is something that we have to deal with. Um, I got this from an article that uh, actually April, April Harris Britt uh, sent out to us. I believe you guys know about dopamine, serotonin, endorphin, okay, oxytocin. And rather than seeking or going with the dopamine or the serotonin in a bad way, in a pathologic way, in an unhealthy way, this screen lists different ways that we can achieve the same type of sensation, feeling, emotion, but in a healthy way. So dopamine reward as opposed to gambling or drugs, completing a task, doing self-care, eating good healthy foods, celebrating little wins. Serotonin, rather than seeking drugs or you know, uh, going out and having affairs or something like that, um, which is oxytocin and serotonin, meditating, running, uh, walking in nature. So this, uh, and Cindy will send this out to folks that you could have it on hand, but this is, a, this, this is all of what we review with coping skills and how to divert from unhealthy ways of getting quick fixes to healthy ways of getting long-term results. Uh, oh, signs that you're in the default mode network, unexplained negative emotions. It's just like stuff that pops up and you don't know why. Um, lack of focus, being distracted, habitually doing things. And this is a great phrase, busy, busy for the sake of being busy. I was actually talking with a client um, earlier today about this, and they were saying that they really want to stop just trying to be busy, to think that they're being productive, but just feeling burnt out. So finally, and then we'll have a discussion. One of the ways of getting out of the default mode network is to see a cat playing rock and roll. Okay, we are at 747 yeah. and I'm gonna stop. Okay, will have the me... uh, PowerPoint at hand and you can review it. But now I'm just gonna kind of say, what are your thoughts about this 